Welcome back to Propaganda by the Seed. We are still just getting started on season two of this podcast, so if you are liking what you're hearing so far, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us on your favorite podcast platform. If you would like to support us with money, you can do that at patreon.com slash propaganda by the sea. Today, we will be talking with Olivia Moore and Kessie Kimball about their work with the Eastern Woodlands Rematriation Collective. But before we get into that, let's hear from our friends at the Channel Zero Podcast Network. One, two, one, two, tune in for another episode of Marooncast. Maroncast is a down-to-earth black radical podcast for the people. Our host, hip-hop anarchist Simile the RBG and sex educator and crochet artist KLC share their reflections on maroons, rebellions, womanism, life, culture, community, trap liberation, and everyday ratchetness. They deliver fresh commentary with the queer, trans, gender non-conforming, fierce, funny, southern girls, anti-imperialist, anti-oppression approach. Poly ad and bullshit. Check out episodes of Marooncast on Channel Zero Network, Buzzsprout, SoundCloud, Google, Apple, and Spotify. All power to the people, all pleasure to the people. Peace. All right. Um, Kessie and Olivia, welcome to Propaganda by the Seed. Thank you for coming on to our humble podcast. Thanks um, for having us. Yeah, do y'all want to... Um, I don't know, like introduce yourselves and give us your pronouns and all that kind of stuff. You can go first, Olivia. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, sure. I was always going to try to defer to you, Kessie. So (laughs) maybe we can can alternate. We'll tap on and off maybe a little. All right. So (laughs) I'm, I'm Olivia Moore. My pronouns are she, they. Um, I'm a member of the Penobscot Nation and one of the co-founders and organizers with Eastern Woodlands Rematriation and really excited to be having this conversation and super excited that Kessie is also part of the conversation also. Awesome. And my name is Kessie Waters Kimball. Um, I am Micmac. I organize with Eastern Woodlands Rematriation and I actually uh, manage an acre farm garden out in Mount Vernon, Maine right now. And that's been my first big foray into, you know, something outside of my backyard. And yeah, I'm excited to talk with you guys. That's awesome. How long have you been um, on this acre? Um, This was, we did the first year was our, this summer. So during the pandemic, that was kind of like the motivation to just go big or go home because Um, We've been doing some uh, community gardening, like in community spaces with raised beds and things like that, but it wasn't very productive. And then just with the crisis, it seemed, um, yeah, all the planets aligned and it was time to do it. And the kids were home from school. So I had had a mini labor force of six kids (laughs) born in high school. So (laughs) did you you can make it work in 2020, then uh, hopefully this year will be that much easier. Yeah, considering it was like a drought and we had all those crazy pests. And so, yeah, for my first time out, I was like, oh, but it, it seemed to, yeah, we grow a ton of food. <laughs> Excellent. Glad to hear it. Oh, my God. I didn't realize that the city of Brunswick has like crazy sewer costs. And so I would just leave the fucking hose on all the time thinking like, oh, it's just <laughs> just going to be like, you know, 30 bucks or something. And then we got like, it was like a thousand dollar sewer bill or something and i was like yo what the hell is this like i i i I don't use the toilet that much like what and then they're like oh it's (laughs) like if you pour it on that butternut squash cost you a thousand (laughs) dollars yeah for real it's like it's like if you pour it on the ground do they do this everywhere else in maine too like charge like you so basically i have to get like a sub um meter so that it doesn't uh, so that they like monitor exactly how much goes through the sewer, so I don't get like overcharged. It's it's insane. So yeah, that was so wow. twenty twenty. Where where are these meters? <laughs> I, I guess you got to bury them. I don't know. You got to <laughs> swallow one and then pass it through to the sewers. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean it's it's really cool to have y'all on here. Um, 
can you talk a little bit about the Eastern Woodlands Rematriate, uh, Rematriation Collective and what uh, what its mission is and what y'all are doing? Yeah. Um, so, so we are. We have a pretty bold vision um, of, of how we undertake our work. Um, so we're a collective of indigenous medicine and food producers throughout tribal communities in the so-called Northeast United States. So we, so Kathy and I, um, you know, are, are Wabanaki and we are in Wabanaki territory and organizing up here, but the collective is really intentional about restoring our traditional trade routes throughout um, tribal communities in the Northeast, reconnecting um, socially and also reclaiming our, you know, political relationships throughout our community. So there's a lot of really powerful work within the collective of supporting the individual needs, the distinct um, context of each of our tribal communities and realities, um, and really supporting that autonomy, but also really like reconnecting and, and really rooting our strength in our collectivity, in the depths of our relationships and our, our bonds like across our communities historically, right, prior to contact. And just seeing that as a really key element to, to achieving food sovereignty and to achieving like the, the reclamation of our indigenous food and healing ways. Um, and so, so within the collective, we are supporting and enhancing the capacity of ex existing Indigenous producers like Tessie, um, like myself, um, other medicine um, medicine makers, and then also initiating projects like the Wabanaki Community Herbal Apothecary, developing a rematriation school, and doing some infrastructure development. Um, just as a really brief kind of examples, and we, we're also really intentional to, you know, engage in um, international spheres, aligning with other um, peasantry movements around achieving food sovereignty, and really like addressing the the root causes of, you know, so many people's like misery and struggles, like really getting down to the root of like how do we address white supremacist settler colonial realities? How do we um, prepare, you know, to address and like what comes next after these imperial like <laughs> nations um, fall, right? Like just preparing for, for what comes next and to build the resilience of, of our community is rooted in, in our culture and traditions. And as indigenous people, we feel so fortunate to have those teachings to guide us. And um, there's so much more that I could say about that. And, um, but I'll I'll pause there and see if there's anything that Essie, uh, excuse me, Tessie wants to add um, about the the collective and how we're doing our work. Thank um, yeah, you. That, that sounds that like I, amazing work. Sorry. <laughs> the thing that I really love about um, the restorative work is just like the reciprocity networks and um, and then building the relationships with other women and. Um, yeah, just connecting our communities in ways that haven't been done in probably hundreds of years and um, healing a lot of wounds. And yeah, it's just been, it's been wonderful for me and it's been a lifeline of sanity to have um, the collective to be a part of and to, um, throughout this crisis. So it's got all that like good, you know, lifting you up inside too. So. <laughs> that, can, can I ask you, what do you, when you say restorative, do you mean like, um, restoring the land or through um like uh sharing medicine or a little bit of all like specifically what what do you mean by that um to me it's a it's a lot of bit of all of it really so it's restoring our personal connections it's restoring our connections and access to land um yeah just uh all these networks that have been either severed or um, impacted by colonialism, by capitalism. It's just like a, a reconnecting to our spirit and our connection to the earth and all of that. Um, it might sound a little corny, but I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah. I think it's, I think it's beautiful. I mean, that's, that's the way to be. It's such a alienated and dark time. I mean, 
just just touching the dirt <laughs> is is enough to yeah center right you. and and i would and just like really building off what kathy is saying like thinking about when i'm thinking about like restoring i'm thinking about it's like this kind of overarching process of restoring relationships and relationships of like what are our responsibilities responsibilities to the earth to our human relatives or more than human relatives like really having the ability to fully engage in those relationships and those responsibilities as indigenous people and that so naturally like comes through our food and healing system and like as we're reclaiming our ways of feeding ourselves and healing ourselves as indigenous people we're reclaiming you know these these ways of relating of being in balance and our reciprocity of really living from a lens of generosity um, restoring collectivity so that so when we're looking at like restoring access to you know various traditional foods or to our fisheries or um, to our clam flats like those it's not just about like those foods that nourish us it's like about the responsibilities that we have to those relatives that it's like they're, that they're not commodified beings to us it's about truly coming back into relationship with our relatives and that's not like said in a light way it's like a really <laughs> Um, really um, deep, yeah, deep embedded way of like true, like like your closest relatives, right? And like, what does it really mean um, to start living and engaging in that way again? Um, That's awesome. It, um, you know, when I hear y'all describing like linking, you know, um, tribal communities together and building food autonomy and building the capacity capacity for you know, healing and medicine and just all this stuff. It, uh, you know, it's off. That's kind of how, like, I think about revolutionary strategy, you know, like this is what, um, this is what needs to be done. People need to build autonomy, but, um, it's really, uh, I think an, an important and interesting move philosophically for y'all to be like, we're not, <laughs> you know, we're restoring something that was, robbed and taken away uh, as opposed to you know reaching for some whatever utopian ideal or something does that does that make sense or yeah yeah i i would push back on like i i don't see what we're doing as as supporting the autonomy like and maybe it's just, maybe maybe we're holding different understandings of like that word but for me, it's like really about interdependence and collectivity and just, yeah, really. And, and so, so, so much of our work. So it's, yes, absolutely. Like the skills and knowledge of, and I guess you could say like technical elements of, of food production in quote unquote sustainable or regenerative ways, right? Which is traditional knowledge, right. um, but it's also the relationships, right? And relationships and how do we organize how do we build collective power? How do we live in community again? How do we cultivate collectively? Like, how do we manage these responsibilities and honor everybody's gifts in contributing to our food system? Everyone has something important to offer. Um, so it's really about collectivity and interdependency. Um, I think is what we're working to, yeah, to, re to reclaim. Right on. Yeah, I mean, when I say autonomy, I mean like a collective interdependency as well. But um, it's, yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, maybe uh, <laughs> like autonomy from the industrial system that uh, that most of the world lives in now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, so when... When you think of the uh, the Wabanaki food system that um, that you're trying to um, 
build back, I guess, or uh, revitalize maybe would be the right word. Um, could you give a little description of, of what that system looks like from your point of view? Um, I think it's a little different depending on um, what regions we're in. So for like up, um, I'm in Kennebec County, so I'm not near like a lot of fisheries except for, you know, the river and whatnot. But a lot of what we have problems up here for is being able to forage, hunt, and fish because most of it's private land. And um, a lot of the land that we do have access to is polluted and like, like fiddlehead flats and stuff that are just completely polluted with horrible chemicals from the rivers. And um, so it's like, so even when we do have access to the places to get medicines and plants and animals, we have to either worry about, you know, confrontation with landowners or pollution or things like that. That's um, so restoring those things is actually like finding, like we need to find accomplices and partners to let us have access to land that is healthy um, and also, we need to go into these polluted places and how can we fix and how can we help heal? So, I mean, there's, there's you know, at least that's from my region. That's how, how I see see my forest system. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And and so much of of this work is is about really understanding the the wholeness of our systems, right? Because when, when I think about Wabanaki food systems, um, we, so like our communities were, were structured in ways that like we were in smaller bands. We like, you know, at different points, like came together collectively, but really we had different like regions and territories. I know for Penobscot people, during the, the summer months, the warm months, we had different regions along the coast where we spent most of our time, um, you know, gathering food and fishing and, um, you know, smoking foods and preparing for winter. Winter, we would move inland, um, and so hunting and trapping. Um, so, so our food systems really, like, were not one one region that were really like full complete like systems and then even within that right having systems of trade within other other bands other tribes and then tribes throughout the region is how we were getting our needs met we weren't like these isolated right there's incredible um you know we, we you know i i don't i'm not a historian um so i can't remember <laughs> all of like the, the specifics of but there's just some there's just been some really incredible examples of just like showing the trade route throughout um you know down through like south america up well so-called south america all the way you know up to like the northeast of and the different varieties of, of seed and corn and um different you know, wampums that have been, you know, traded across our region, so, and medicine. So anyways, for me, it's really about, like, full systems and thinking about that in um, really, like, large ecological terms, um, but also over, like, systems of time and, and, re and reclaiming relationships. So um, that's, that's sort of like an overview, but, yeah, it absolutely includes our fisheries. It means having access coastal areas again which obviously are highly privatized and closed down um and are really difficult areas for us to have access to and then yeah like quality of of the land that we have access to and like the amount of degradation and pollution so it yes people like doing work to clean the land but also to like fight to stop there's a lot of right like landfill expansions and um, you know, potential mining op operations that they're looking at, like coming into northern Maine and some of the, the fish farms. And there's all kinds of areas where we need um, accomplices to show up hard <laughs> and work for our collective um, future to, to stop these industrial um, practices from continuing to, like, ocup occupy and, yeah, degrade our... Our shared home now are there um specific uh industrial projects uh 
coming coming in up north that you are keeping your eye on? Like I know some of my friends are really concerned about the Pembroke gold mine. Yeah, I, this is Olivia. I I so Kathy, I welcome you if you have. So I just I'm just Haven't kind of, of like. <laughs> Yeah, and I know there's like like the, there's like I don't know if it's the same the wolf den mining project. I think they're looking at it's like up in Rustic County. I don't know, right? There's like so many like different angles that colonization is coming at us all the freaking time. <laughs> um, but also yeah. just thinking about like the the fish farm that um, we'll be going into Bucksport, and then that they're looking at. Um, most likely is going to go into Belfast and go right out into the, you know, Penobscot Bay. Is this just, and, and then also, yeah, the discharge that is occurring in the Penobscot River um, from the, the new opening of the, the fine paper plants up there. So, and I'm sure there's, there's many more. Never ending. <laughs> Capitalism don't stop. Not even for a, <laughs> no. not even for a global pandemic. Um, have you have you found that um, the pandemic has sort of um, I don't know like helped uh, I don't know like drawn people into your work and made made the project of uh, rematriation like giving it more teeth. You know what I mean? But maybe teeth isn't really the the term, but. Um, do you find that like with COVID-19 and everything that's been happening uh, to reservations under the, under the pandemic that like that your work is uh, having a broader resonance in your communities? Like have more people been wanting to get involved or. Well, that's like Olivia's um, organizing of the apothecary that has like exploded during COVID. We've seen so many um just uh, herbalists and other um, healer people sending medicines to us and supplies to us so that we could put together baskets for people. So there's little, little things like that that have shown like a definite um, explosion of interest and in people wanting to help and to cultivate herbs and medicines for us coming up in the growing season. So that's one thing, but we've also gotten a lot of support just from individuals and stuff too. Yeah. We I mean, really it, were ready has- for the crisis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kathy. Oh, no, no, no. I was just saying, like, we're well suited for the crisis that came. It was just like everything that we were building for and um, planning for, it just kind of um, sped up with the COVID crisis. It actually kind of helped us a little bit to just get our word out there and to um, let people know what we were doing. Yeah, I know within the collective, um, you know, when when COVID was first kind of starting and you know we didn't I mean I think we still don't understand right like the the depth and the breadth of like what (laughs) is is you know going to continue to occur with the pandemic but at the beginning we very much had a sense of like um yeah that this was going to impact our our communities like we under we knew that every everything challenging does because of how colonialism and continued like you know genocide and occupation makes us so vulnerable um so we knew we knew this was going to be impacting our our people in communities disproportionately we also felt like okay like we have been like working to restore these relationships amongst ourselves to really build and support like to bring ourselves together to build our capacity um to feed our people to get medicines to our people um so we felt like okay we've been preparing for this this moment so in that way we felt really like grounded in having you know like a a collective space already to respond together um but it has also been really like how the hell do you build collectivity how do you like practice culture and collective cultivation when you're not sure how to like safely be together and so much of our culture is is you know, practicing ceremony and living closely together. So it has been both, I mean, it's both like this important opportunity for us to really like engage with and use this opportunity to support our people. But it has, yeah, I mean, it's 
it's been really like so many people are hungry and so many of our children are in crisis because of this level of isolation and disconnection and i mean a lot of us grown people are too hell like it's it's not pretty and um there's a lot of responsibility and weight right now we're absolutely like you know our ancestors are behind us to to do this work but um yeah i wouldn't like i don't I don't think we needed this. Like, I don't think this was needed to happen. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think we needed it, but it, but it's here and we're engaging with it. And, um, but yeah, in terms of like figuring out, like just in the beginning process of like, how do you restore collectivity when you can't be together? There's, yeah, we're, we're still like trying to learn and figure those things out. So we're not, putting our already vulnerable communities at, at higher risk. You know, I, I, I throughout as, as y'all have been talking, um, you know, you talking about how you're preparing for this and, um, or these were the kinds of things that y'all were organizing for. I'm curious if you like frame things in terms, terms of like, you know, the American empire or whatever it represents is like, you know, in its death, death throes. And, uh, like, is that how you see it? Do you, do you see it as like a collapse period? And, um, that's helping to guide your actions a little. I think we're definitely in a period of collapse, but I think it's going to be a slow agonizing collapse. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I do not disagree, Cassie. I mean, <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I mean, right, for, like, for us as Wabanaki people, like, our, like, our, our people have been here in deep relationship with the land in Wabanaki and so-called Maine for over 12,000 years, right? 12,000 years. So, to have, um, this colonial empire, the so-called like United States, this project being here, you know, however you kind of gauge the start of it, six to 400 years, like, yeah, haven't done a very good job. Um, and so for me, like, I just try to keep it in this like longer term perspective of like, um, like this reality that we're in now, like this is not um, all there ever has been. This is only this like blip in time. So how can we um, really do everything that's within our power in, in, in this moment while we're here um, to really just like prepare our children and communities to be resilient for the challenges that are ahead and um, to just try to, create some opportunities and spaces for connection and, you know, and peace um, um, amongst the inevitable chaos and hoping that they can be healthy enough to, you know, continue this, this journey of just trying to survive while this, this process runs it, its course. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that this is actually, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, like some of the like, you know, indicators of of a significant. <laughs> I mean, it, right? It's it's really complicated because when we say, like, I'm, uh, yeah, right? Like the that the the folks that are the most impacted by collapse, in a lot of ways, are those of us, yeah, right, like that at the heart of imperialism are, are being the most harmed now. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know what I what I hope for. Um, I don't think it's going to be a quick journey either. But yeah, just trying to keep it in perspective. Okay. Our people have been here 12,000 years. We have like <laughs> survived like, you know, ice ages. We will persist fertilizer for the future (laughs) 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 oh god um well i i guess i was just wondering like from a um technical perspective um you know olivia when we first reached out um the i was like oh we just wanted we wanted to 
see talk to someone who's actually done the um four sisters poly called three sisters poly culture and uh you know got it you know had it actually producing or whatever and when i talked to you about it you were like uh you know what we're doing is much you know isn't isn't just about you know cooking and uh growing annuals um but i liked yeah i liked what you had to say about um the three sisters so i was wondering if um yeah you wanted to talk about talk about that polyculture and how you know you have a mixed relationship with how uh people in permaculture talk or think about it yeah i think i think a part of what i was um responding to with the question um about you know an interest in indigenous folks engaging with with like you know three sisters planting which yes absolutely that is a beautiful beautiful um practice and and relationship of interdependency and reciprocity that feeds and nourishes us and has so much to to teach us and is absolutely, you know, a traditional practice of food production. My sort of like push back on that is I feel like there's been kind of like little silos or like little blips of like things that have been that that are kind of widely accepted as indigenous knowledges and that being one of them like, oh, like three sisters planting like these you know, three particular plants and like, this is indigenous knowledge systems and talk about this. And it's like, yes, but our food systems were, especially here, like, um, you know, the so-called like Northeast United States, like we absolutely had, um, you know, cultivated like, like larger, um, you know, areas that, that were cultivating and growing food, but we also had incredible agroforestry, right? Like, for millennia, we had shaped these incredible food forests and, um, you know, like our hunting grounds and trapping grounds were nurtured for, for millennia and the clam flats and, you know, the seaweed beds, like those, like the abundance that was here in the United States was not because like there were not many like humans here to take into harm. It was because there were humans here that understood ourselves to be relatives and a part of these systems so anyways like our just just our indigenous knowledge in food systems um is so much more expansive than 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 three sisters or um so i just think it's like really important to acknowledge that and and i tend to kind of like push back on just like looking at it really um our, our knowledge systems really Nearly. So I, I think that might have been what I had going on for me. Maybe I didn't articulate it at the time. <laughs> I know. And for me, it's funny because I did do a Three Sisters garden this year, but I have like, I'm micmac. Like, we've never been farmers. Three Sisters was not a part of our culture. Um, it just didn't really happen. You know, like we would come and trade for corn, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, but. Mm-hmm. um. So, so gardening and, and growing, um, that is totally foreign to me. And, yeah. <laughs> On a, uh, a similar note of a, um, a piece of traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge that is kind of people are coming around to realize is an important part of a lot of ecosystems. Um, I'm curious if... Um, the Wabanaki make made use of cultural burning or, you know, using that fire as a, a management tool. Um, or if that was something that was not really a, a part of this ecosystem. Burning was a big part of mm-hmm. our control. Mm-hmm. That's like why we have a lot of tick problems. A lot of the pest problems we have now are because we haven't had burns in hundreds of years. That's what I think anyways. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and a specific thing, I've, I've heard this uh, bit of hearsay, um, but I've never really been able to track down a, a real source for it. Uh, but I, 
I keep asking people until I, you know, hopefully will one day find an answer. But I have heard that under um, indigenous land management, a lot of the oaks that uh, are in the eastern forest would actually bear annually um, as opposed to the like masting cycle that um, they do now um, because mm -hmm. that that masting is um, a response to supposedly acorn weevil mostly. Hmm. Yeah. Your mystery continues, I think. <laughs> yeah. I, I might never find a real answer to that, but I'm going to keep asking. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Like, you know, burning, um, you know, was, was a traditional land management practice by Wabanaki people. And, and I think about it in, so like in, in matriarchal worldviews of um, really centering, nurturing in all things. And, um, and again, thinking about our relationships as um, spaces of responsibility and reciprocity. I, so that means nurturing, um, nurturing all of our relatives or more than human relatives and nurturing future generations. So, so burning, absolutely like it fits within this framework of what it means to like to center nurturing and regeneration right um and so things that from like uh you know a colonial perspective can be seen as like destructive really can be understood as like supporting these cycles of balance and regeneration the same with um you know, like respectful, like, you know, manage, like, um, like herd management of the, of the various populations, that that's all like respectful of, of balance and overall like health and well-being. But that's only done by being an incredible deep relationship and like humbling ourselves to listening and not coming in like we already know how to like, you know, manage and take life. Um, and so it just there's just this whole other kind of way of what it means to take life and to manage populations when we understand that they are our relatives. Yeah, one of the most tragic things about, you know, obviously the meat industry is just imagining that 40% of the slaughtered animals are just being th they're they're just being thrown away, you know, as like a mm. it's so it's just so it's such a ruthless and sad uh death machine that we that we got going it's it's insane mm -hmm. um correct yeah, disrespectful <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's it's disrespectful it's um it's just fucked um but what you were saying about ticks kind of blows my mind um so if you're having deer tick problems burn set a fire basically well there's even other diseases like with the deer there's like wasting disease that they're getting because they're not burning and what happens is the disease gets passed on when the deer defecate and so then the grass grows in the spring and the deer will go and eat the, the grass that they pooped on the year before and they're getting this wasting disease where they can't gain weight and they just die sick and that is all directly related to just not burning and it allows like different you know, bacteria and pesty things to thrive. Wow. Yeah. Chronic, chronic wasting disease is just a, a mind bogglingly bizarre um, yeah. it, thing. Cause it's a, a prion. Um, like a, it's a self replicating protein disease. That's just really weird to think about. Prehistoric shit. <laughs> <laughs> um you know one thing that um just blew my mind like moving here from colorado is just how much forageable food is around us like it's um it's kind of insane you can almost eat everything um mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh you know as i was Not i was yellow snow. <laughs> but I, I was reading um robin kimmerer's description of food forests about the time when i was like discovering them here and so i guess i was just wondering like generally speaking like technically or specifically which 
like um which ancient plants or which you know uh, native plants i should say are you like excited about um using and cooking with like you know i don't know whether it's burdock or ground nuts or you know um husk cherries or something else i, I i'm just wondering if there are you know specific plants that you um you like to use so that you're excited about promoting Obviously, my fiddleheads, but I'm not telling you where I pick them. <laughs> no, but I've actually gotten um, marshmallow root has been my my thing that I'm all excited about this year. I really, it's the first time I've actually really, really um, worked with it outside of just making a tea. I started making like salves and infused oils and stuff with it. And so I'm all about like marshmallow. It is such a versatile, awesome plant and it smells really good too. So. <laughs> Mm, yeah marshmallow marshmallow was like that's my new baby <laughs> yeah last year that was totally well not like the previous year it was totally like a really special plant for me too um so my mind my mind goes to a lot of you know i'm thinking of of cedar and i'm thinking of of white pine i'm thinking of um tamarack um are, are a lot of you know kind of what it, especially during winter months been spending some more time with uh, my mind also goes to i'm going to say this because i think there's like in, maybe hopefully like maybe some kind of like important <laughs> teaching in it <laughs> i'm sorry if there's not but my mind also goes to this like reluctance to share with with um in a specific way with with white audiences <laughs> about specific plants or medicines um, or practices because of these histories it, to to contemporary um, like practices of um, of of appropriation of over harvest and so like and just kind of going to like not yet feeling like I, it, it comes, it comes down to an element of like trust. And I try to like remind myself, okay, it's not about like native people coming to trust like white folks or white settler communities or movement spaces. It's really about them doing the work to like show and like earn that trust back um, for us to be able to like really be in a space to like share really specifically so i'm like i have i'm kind of having like two trains of thought when that question was asked and i'm like maybe there's something important from just saying this other line of, of thought <laughs> on my mind that that i'll just be real that like you know like that i'm really and i'm not the only one um but just really like careful about like what knowledge to to share to share where because it very often is um, weaponized or or co-opted. Um, so, anyways, yeah. Protective mama. Yeah, I mean, yo, you, you, you never know who's listening, though. Like, some startup bro mm -hmm. could be listening and be like, "Ooh, I just had the greatest idea for native copyright native medicine. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's made from yeah. So yeah, no, I feel you. No. And no, I, I, I don't. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I don't think it's even that. Like, I think there's maybe some broader responsibility that actually like needs to be taken by a whole array of, um, you know, like white settler communities, in, including like the anarchist community, where like I have a lot of affinity and a lot of like you know, white. Like most of my white friends, right, are anarchists. <laughs> oh God, I'm just like they're going to be anarchists. But there's also like community responsibility there, also. So it's not, um, yeah, not just like the bro community. <laughs> Absolutely, I, uh, I can certainly see where you're coming from. Well, let me ask you, you this: Was it um, what like as far as like learning all this stuff um, and putting together? this you know this analysis and um studying all this stuff like 
was it hard to come to all this knowledge? Like, was it just around you and you just soaked it up? Or did you have to do a lot of research? Did you have to like, um, yeah. How hard has it been to uncover all, all this, um, all this knowledge. I woke up like this. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lifetime, a lifetime of, of seeking, like seeking and seeking and making mistakes. And yeah, but it's a culmination of a whole lifetime of learning for me. And Yeah. Um, I would say I, <laughs> what knowledge? <laughs> I'm a student. Oh, <laughs> I don't know anything. I don't know yeah, anything. like I'm, I'm trying to be in all, like all these spaces so that like maybe I can, I can know something or, or be supportive of, of, you know, something for others. I, yeah, I feel like, you know, just really surrounding myself with, other people who are just really committed to community, to sharing knowledge, to reclaiming knowledge, um, and, you know, really, like, being connected to to our ancestors, to our elders. Um, I learn a lot from, from plants, really, for me. Um, dreams. Dreams are another really important, like, space of, of learning for me um yeah there's like some research in there and there's some like you know like archives and you know stuff like that and but a lot of it is and 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 connecting with um other like communities in struggle other communities like working um on the land you know like yeah there's so I'm very much uh, a student, but um, feel like it's just driven by like a need to survive and trying to support the survival of of my people, Wabanaki people. Um, that yeah, I'm just driven to to keep going so that I can like as best possible like support support some semblance of survival and maybe well being for Wabanaki people. So a lot of it is like survival driven. That's awesome, Olivia. I'm I'm noticing that we're coming up on three o'clock here, um, yeah. and I just want to see if you needed to um, check out for a few minutes, and if you would be able to continue uh, our conversation after doing what whatever you need to do. No, I no, I would not be able to continue because I would okay. have a yeah, cool, yeah, a team in the car that. <laughs> yep. I will need to connect with. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, it? so I don't. If, I don't know if there's like a, another question that you want me to respond to, or I'm happy to, to whichever way. But I can. I have a couple more minutes. Um, Aaron, did you have any specific questions you wanted answered, or did we uh, touch on? No, I think we got most of my questions. Um, my big question for y'all is if uh, I really liked the idea of, you know, people with lots of land or access to land opening it up. Um, if there are people listening who have access to land that um, want to share uh, share with y'all for foraging or stuff like that, what is the best way for people to get in touch with y'all? Yeah. Um, so, so we have a, a Wabanaki land rematriation work group, um, where, where these conversations and these agreements of, um, land use or harvest use agreements, but also like land return conversations and commitments are occurring. Um, but so I can be emailed and I, so yeah, I can be emailed. I can provide that. So maybe it can be in like the description of this. Um, um, trying to think of there's any other, or I mean, Eastern Woodlands Rematriation. We're on Facebook and Instagram, though, like not very active in those spaces. We, we're trying. Um, we're trying. Like, <laughs> I was, I was going to say, we're, we're really not. <laughs> like, <laughs> like not it was created. Kind of, 
<laughs> right. Yeah, I'm worried about like the like public kind of persona or like outward um, image of our work. But yeah, so Eastern Woodlands Rematriation on Facebook, Instagram, you can message us there also. But I'll provide my email. Um, and yeah, so we do have um, a map of, of where folks have offered. Um, I'm just putting that together, Tessie, so it's almost <laughs> in a stage where I can share it out. Um, for, yeah, just trying to get organized with the, the various land um, access commitments. So that is is fabulous. That's awesome. The work y'all are doing is sounds so so amazing and uh it's been really cool to hear about what y'all are doing it's it's it goes so much deeper than i had uh originally understood it and it's much much respect yeah and thank you both so much for your time uh to uh talk to us today i really appreciate yeah, that yeah i've definitely enjoyed it i've enjoyed it excellent yes yeah, thank you for for the opportunity, and it's always nice nice to to connect with some folks that understand that we need to that this the system is is collapsing, and we need to get real about like we got to make some moves and prepare our <laughs> communities. So, yeah, and bunkers, it would be great. Say that again. I said bunkers are not where it's at. <laughs> especially in especially when the tides are rising. <laughs> Shit. Exactly.